let's jump into the scripture reading here. I'm going to start in verse 11. I'm going to finish out chapter 2. And let's read this together. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made by flesh, made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, would you help us as we seek to understand your word this morning? We want to know and understand what it means, and so we need you to give sight to our eyes and give hearing to our ears and give understanding to our hearts. Would you do this, Father? For our good and for your glory, we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. I want to ask you what you hope for. What is it that you hope for? When you set your affections, your longings in certain places, what is it that you think is going to satisfy your heart and give you joy, give you peace, give you fulfillment? If you can fill these things in, then, then you know what it is that you're hoping for. So what might it be? Is it financial? Are your hopes set in finances? Well, how does that express itself? Do you remember when you were a kid and you looked forward to your birthday every single year because you knew what was on your birthday list and that gift that you had wanted or the toy that would come? And every year it seemed to go by and it was cool, but it wasn't it wasn't quite as fulfilling as you thought, you know, and so you just needed to dream bigger the next year, right? Well, now you get to my age, and, you know, you aren't excited about the presents on your birthday. It's just one more year. But we still think of toys that we want to buy, even at my age, and you might even hope at them, right? Is your hopes financial? Or perhaps your hopes are in a vacation or an experience. Somehow, whenever I've, I've got a vacation on the calendar, I always think it's going to be more rewarding and fulfilling than it ends up being with little ones in tow. I don't know. But some people just long for those experiences. Is, is your hopes in a career that would be fulfilling? Are your hopes tied up in your family, in the well-being of your children? Are your hopes political or national, even as we look to the future? Is that where you find hope and think that your expectations will be met and satisfied? I ask these questions because for you and I as Christians, the people of God must have our hopes in alignment with God's word or else heartache, despair, and disappointment is sure to set in. One of the things that Anna and I have noticed about parenting Uh, we have to be careful with the expectations that we set for our children. Otherwise, if they're hoping for something that doesn't come to fruition, it's like uh, all despair in the house, right? So take any typical Friday where a kid looks forward to the future, and with the ages of our kids, if we have somehow set the expectation that at the end of a long, fun family day, 
our kids are going to be able to enjoy pizza and family uh, movies and video games to their heart's content. I, I mean, I think you could ask Reed, that would be a pretty exciting family experience for the ages that our kids are. And if we've built that expectation up, and they're hoping pizza and video games, and all of a sudden 5 o'clock rolls around, and it's like, yeah, how about salad and toast and go to bed early? Oh my goodness. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. That will be, right, you're hoping one thing and you go the other. So, for us as Christians, if our hopes aren't set in the same place that God tells us they should be set, well, we're going to be very disillusioned in the world and as we watch the world unfold. And it even, this, this is true both on a personal level as Christians and on a corporate level as a church. If, if we don't have the right expectations of what is the church in the world today and what did God task the church with being, then we won't be hoping for the right thing. And, and we'll become very disillusioned as we watch the world play out around us. So, where should we set our hopes in relation to the world? Paul helps us with that in the passage today. Paul is going to help us set our sights on a picture of something that tells us, Church, this is what your job is today. And he's going to use some word pictures that helps us. And one of the most powerful ones he's going to use today is, is, ha is in the realm of uh, um, building. So I want you to think about those of you that have had familiarity with building projects and architectural experiences. You know how in a building project, when you go to a construction site and you see that poster or that picture that's printed and it's the architectural rendering of what the final project is going to look like and that gives you some perspective. I remember this is back when Anna and I were living in Denver 10 or 12 years ago, walking in downtown Denver and having the chance of seeing a construction site downtown where you could look through the fence and look several stories down into the ground, surrounded by high-rise buildings, and there was a picture on the fence of what this future skyscraper was going to look like. It was a really cool thing just to see this tiny little hole in the ground and the steel work already going on, and you began to think, oh, I know what the completed picture is going to look like. Well, when you and I see construction sites, and, and, and what do we see? We see a mess. We see noise. We see, in one sense, you, you might be tempted to think, this is just a bunch of chaos going around, right? That's, the, that's what I thought the last time that I was on 295 trying to get on the bridge to go to the airport. And I was just like, does anybody actually know how this is going together? Or is it just trucks moving dirt from one... Well, you, you might think that when you see a construction site of just, does anyone know what's going on here? But when you see the picture, it gives you confidence of, wait a minute, don't get your hopes off track. There is a bigger plan. There is a bigger purpose. And so we can somewhat endure the mess and the chaos because we know what the end game is. Paul somewhat uses a similar word picture just to help us say, listen, in the church, here's, here's where God's going. Here's what God is doing. And this word picture, in essence, might serve as an architectural rendering that will help you and I. Okay, in the time that God has given to you and I on this earth, what is it? 70 years? 80 years? 90 years? Whatever it might be. In the years that God gives you to Shawnee Baptist, what is that? Is it five years or is it five decades? What, what, what is it that we should be doing and where should we set our hearts so that we have them set in the right place. That's what I want us to think about this morning, so that our expectations are brought into alignment with God's word. Let's, let's look at the passage here. And I want to start with verses 11 through 18. And I want to read these verses. I'm going to read them all at once. And I need to summarize these verses, because there is far more here than I could hope to explain this morning there's far deeper questions that would need to be unpacked in a different context. But as I read it, I'm, I'm going to try to summarize it afterwards. As I'm reading it, one of the things I want you to listen to and pay attention to is that verses 11 through 18, in a sense, parallel verses 1 through 10. What we've just walked through in the last couple of weeks at the start of the chapter, remember verses 1 through 10 were Paul was bringing 
these Gentile believers, he, the, uh, th- these Christians there at Ephesus and wherever else this letter circulated to, he was helping them see, listen, do you realize your state before God? You were once dead in your sins, but now you've been made alive in Christ. Paul walked through that in those 10 verses, and he focused on their vertical relationship with God. He's going to do the same, this is the way you were before, and now this is the way you are now. He's going to do that same thing, but not only is he going to focus on their relationship with God, he's going to focus on their relationship with one another. And you're going to hear similar parallels back and forth. Look at this starting in verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made by, in the flesh by the hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was kind of a long, complicated, technical way of saying, you Gentiles who were called Gentiles by the Jews because you weren't circumcised and the Jews were, You were far from Christ, and you had no hope in the world. And this is what Paul says in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Okay, again, far more here than I can cover, but let me just summarize what's going on. Paul's talking about the relationship between the Jew and the Gentile and how they have both been brought into right relationship with God, but also into harmony with one another. Now, you need to understand what the relationship between the Jew and the Gentile was like to understand what God is talking, what Paul is talking about here. Remember, who were the Jewish people? And even as we walked through it as a church in Genesis last year, the Jews were the descendants of Abraham. They were God's chosen people. This is what it meant for the Israelite people to have this special privileged relationship that the Israelites were the ones who were near to God. It was the Israelites, the Jewish people, who had this special relationship with God. And that's the only way it was prior to the time of Christ. And Paul is drawing attention and highlighting this. This is, not only did their sins separate them from God, verses 1 through 10, but it was also the fact that they were Gentiles. They were far from God. Now, the mark of being a Jew, the most primary physical mark, was that outward mark of circumcision. That was how in their faith they said, yes, I'm going to be a part of this covenant community to, in obedience to have the boys circumcised. And so the Jewish people saw their relationship with God through their faith, through the ordinances, through the commands, and that caused a certain... looking down on anyone who was uncircumcised, the Gentiles, those, those who weren't a part of the people of God. So if the Jews were in a very privileged position because of their relationship with God, where did that leave the Gentiles? Think about it. Well, it says it in verse 12, they had no hope. They were without God. So prior to the time of Christ, if you're here this morning and you're not Jewish, you and I found ourselves in this position of being in a place with no hope prior to Christ and without God. And, and Paul comes and he helps them to see, listen, this is the way that it is. So try to imagine what that would have been like if you're here anywhere in this region, whether it was Ephesus or anywhere else this letter went, and you're a Gentile person, and, and prior to the time of Christ... And if you haven't yet heard about who Christ is and what he has done, you have no relationship with the God of Israel, with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, perhaps you've heard of who this God is and the fact that he has a special people in Israel that you, perhaps you could even go to Jerusalem to see where the Jewish people worshipped. 
But why would you even do that? Say you wanted to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and to get into the temple. Well, if you're from Ephesus or anywhere else in the Gentile region, you know where you got to sit? You, where you got to stand the closest you could get to worship? You didn't get into the temple. You stayed in the court of the Gentiles. It was a permanent barrier that, that not only reminded them of their religious separation from God, but think about it from the Jewish perspective. There was a reason that the Jews thought of Gentiles as dogs. There was this animosity. There was this looking down upon between the Jew and the Gentile because of the Jew's presumed privileged position before God. William Barclay writes about this. And to help you put yourself in the mindset of the relationship between Jew and Gentile. And he says this. The Jew had an immense contempt for the Gentile. The Gentiles, said the Jews, were created by God to be fuel for the fires of hell. God, they said, loves only Israel of all the nations that he has made. It was not even lawful to render help to a Gentile mother in her hour of sorest need, for that would simply be to bring another Gentile into the world. Until Christ came, the Gentiles were an object of contempt to the Jews. The barrier between them was absolute. If a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl, or if a Jewish girl married a Gentile boy, the funeral of that Jewish boy or girl was carried out. Such contact with a Gentile was the equivalent of death. There's the mindset between Jew and Gentile. Do you understand why Paul had to write so much to the early church to help them mend these relationships and to help the unity to be present in the church. And, and the sad thing for the Jews was is they didn't realize and didn't understand God's heart from the nations going all the way back to Genesis 12 that even when God made this covenant with Abraham, in view was the blessings of the entire world. And so when the Jewish heart was corrupted by the rest of their you think of what took place with the Pharisees and those who didn't understand, those Jews who wrongly worshipped God solely from a prideful position of being in that privileged state. Well, you see how the barriers broke down, the, the lines of communication, the relationships. It was not a pleasant place to be. And not only was there animosity there, but there was, as verse 14 says, there was a dividing wall of hostility. So what happens when Christ enters the scene? What are these verses talking about? If I'm summarizing them, Christ comes and he breaks down that dividing wall of hostility. Both the vertical dividing wall that separated the Gentiles from God and the horizontal dividing wall that separated Jew and Gentile from one another. And now Christ makes peace between Jew and Gentile. It's a beautiful passage of reconciliation and unity, and it's a beautiful passage of God working through Christ to break down that dividing wall so that the Gentile could be included. Another pastor told the story, a World War II story, of American soldiers in World War II who had a fellow soldier that died in the battle. And they carried their friend the body of their friend, to the closest cemetery that they could. And it happened to be a Catholic cemetery. And they desired to bury the body of their soldier there. But when the Catholic priest was told that the individual was not a Catholic, well, then the priest said, I'm sorry, he can't be buried in this cemetery. And so the soldiers thought, well, what is it that we should do? And the next best thing that they thought of was to bury the body outside the fence of the cemetery. And they did that through the night. And the next morning, they returned, wanting to pay their last respects to the body. And they could not find a grave outside the fence. What happened to the body? And they spoke with the priest. And the priest said, well, I spent the first half of the night laying awake, feeling bad for what I had told you. And the second half of the night, I spent moving the fence so that the body was brought inside. Now, whether or not it's a true story, it's a picture that reminds you and I and reminds the Gentile believers, do you realize what Christ has done? He has moved the fence. He's broken down the dividing wall so that in Christ, Jew and Gentile are now 
united. There is peace. There is harmony. There is a relationship that there is now one new man in place of the two. This is not a continuation of something that God was doing with Israel, but it's entirely new in what God has done in the church, that there's no longer Jew or Gentile, but at, uh, the Christian has unity in Christ as God does this new thing. So think about this for you and I. Think about the unity and the reconciliation that's represented in this passage, where both Jew and Gentile could become united in Christ, and why the rest of the New Testament talks about this need for unity and harmony in the church. Think about your relationships that you have with other Christians, with those who think differently than you. Does the unity that you, we have in Christ picture the reality of what God has done for you in Christ? That there is no difference. And so though our primary barrier this morning is not Jew and Gentile for most of the people in this congregation, there are still barriers where we think of us versus them or where there are dividing walls of hostility. And yet if we're in Christ, not dividing walls of hostility to the same extent as here, but still those things that can separate us, and yet if we are in Christ, our relationships need to picture and model what Christ has done for us. So we'll think about that more as we go through our passage this morning, but think about that unity from those first few verses. Later on this morning, as we get to the communion table, keep your Bible open, because I want to come back to these first eight verses, as there's more phrases that I want to draw out in verses 11 through 18. But for now, I want to keep moving, and I want you to see in verses 19 through 22, there's two pictures that Paul uses to talk about what God has done in this new people that he has created in Christ. Look at verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So the first of the two pictures that Paul picks up on is this idea of household. It's a family picture. Paul tells the Christians that they're no longer foreigners. They're no longer strangers. But rather, they have this sense of belonging. Their identity is bound up in the fact that they are fellow citizens with God's people. So these Gentiles who used to be far off, they're, they're now fellow citizens and their identity and belonging, it, they're not second class citizens. They're not homeless, but they belong to the household of God. And they are members of the household of God. Now the emphasis here of being in the household of God and this family picture, the emphasis is not on the brother-sister relationship that that creates for you and I. It's an emphasis on the parent-child relationship, the father-child. Whose house is this? Whose family is this that Paul is talking about? It's God's family. It's God's household. And you and I have a place in that house because of what God has done for us. Peter O'Brien says it this way, thinking about the family. What does it mean that you and I are members of God's house, that we are part of his family? Peter O'Brien says that in the Roman world of the day, to be a member of a household meant refuge and protection, at least as much as the master was able to provide. It also meant identity and gave the security that comes with a sense of belonging. Christian, do you realize your identity in Christ? Do you realize the sense of belonging that that gives you? Uh, particularly for those of you that perhaps you look at your family relationships in this earth, and perhaps you don't have the family relationships that you desire. Perhaps you don't have that sense of belonging or refuge or protection from an earthly family that you would have desired. And do you realize that in Christ, you are a member of God's household? The sense of identity and purpose and belonging that that ought to give you as a Christian. If you're looking for that, you will find it supremely in Christ. That's where our hope belongs to be. So this gives you and I a belonging in our own family. But secondly, 
though the brother-sister relationship is not firstly in view here, it is an accurate picture in other places of Scripture, and it once again reminds us, does our relationships in the church, if we're members of God's household, and if we're God's children, well, once again, we need to evaluate the health of our relationships in the church because together we're a part of the same family. Together we are a part of the same house. Then going on in verse 20, here's what Paul says, that God's household here is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. These don't think Old Testament prophets, think those in the New Testament that had that role of prophet, the apostles who were eyewitnesses. Both of these would be temporary New Testament offices that until the canon of the New Testament was completed, there were those who who uh, helped establish the foundation that the early church was built upon. They spoke an authoritative divine message. We'll speak a little bit more about this when we get to Ephesians chapter 4. But these were the people who, who carried the message that served as a foundation for the church, for this new group of people to be built on. And Jesus Christ himself was the chief cornerstone, was that first most prominent important stone that the foundation was laid upon. In the building practices of the day, and the word, the, the, the word cornerstone here is borrowing on some language from the book of Isaiah, but there would be a primary stone that the builders would lay first, much bigger than any other stone in the building. And it would often go in a corner and you get that one stone right and from there you can build out the walls of the rest of the structure. Jesus Christ is that for the church. He's the one that broke down the dividing wall of hostility. He's the one that serves as the cornerstone for the family of God. And then the apostles and the prophets came and continued to bring this message and this is what the structure is being built upon and around. It encourages you and I because of who Jesus is. And by the way, that's still how God is building his church. On a divine authoritative message that's built on Jesus Christ and God uses his word by his spirit to build his church. That's the only way that God continues to do that. But notice then in verse 21, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Here's the second picture. No longer is it just the family or household picture. Paul now includes the idea of a temple or a construction site or a building. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. There's a foundation from the prophets and the apostles. And all of us in Christ are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So now this speaks to you and I in our role or function. If the, if the household imagery tells us our identity, gives us a belonging, well, the temple picture, and specifically the temple under construction, this helps you and I with what's our role? What's our function? There's a couple of things that you need to notice about this temple from verses 21 and 22. Number one, it's still an active, ongoing construction site. Did you see that? Th- these verbs are, are uh, presently taking place. You are being built. This is actively happening, which means it's not finished yet. So think about the fact that God is actively growing his church into a temple, into a building. God's putting his people in place. And the church is this ongoing construction site whereby God is accomplishing his plans. And it's in the middle of taking place. So I would stop and just ask you and say, are you a part of the building project? If there's a project going on, have you gotten involved? Like, are you in? Have you declared your faith? Are you a Christian? That's the first thing I'm talking about. Have you said... I'm a sinner who needs Jesus, and it's Jesus' death on the cross that has paid for my sins. You need to be involved in this ongoing process that God is doing, and you need to repent of your sins and come to faith in Christ because of what he's done. Have you declared that faith through baptism? Have you let the church know that I am a Christian and I desire to walk in obedience to the Lord's command in baptism? Secondly, Are your expectations in the right place? 
Think about what God is doing through corporately the church as God is doing this active work in and through the church. This means that the church is not an end in and of itself. The church is a means to an end. If we're still under construction, then the primary objective hasn't yet been reached. What does that mean? There are some Christians that approach the church as if it should be the end and a finished product. But God didn't save you and put you in a church because he expected all of your dreams, needs, expectations to be met here and now as if this church is somehow the final end and heaven on earth and all of your needs will be met here. That's not God's point. And the reason many Christians are disillusioned is because they treat the church that way and expect something that it can never rise to. Rather, God saved you to be part of a process. And what is that process? What is the ongoing process that God is fashioning and forming the church into? Well, it's a dwelling place for God. That's what the text says. Now, let's think about the dwelling place for God. Because the fact that the church isn't finished yet doesn't mean that there aren't real benefits to be experienced in the middle of here and now. Now, this is the difference between the church and a construction project, right? You walk into downtown Philly and you see some gated off construction area. Chances are, unless you're a contractor working in the facility, you're not getting in the building until it's done. They're not opening that thing halfway finished and just telling people, yeah, elevators next week, for now, use a bungee cord, right? It's, it's not the way it works. You don't get in until it's finished. The church is different. The church isn't finished yet, and yet you can begin now to experience the benefits of the dwelling place of God. So think about how important the dwelling place of God is in the story of Scripture. Go back to the beginning, in the garden, in the book of Genesis. Man walked with God until sin entered the picture, right? And so what happens then when sin ruins some of that fellowship? You see God working among his people to restore something of that relationship and communion and fellowship. Some of it begins to happen in the temple through the people of Israel. It was a way that a sinful people could still have communion and fellowship and relationship that God could dwell and literally his presence could reside among his people there in the temple. And yet, you and I are ultimately waiting for the new Jerusalem when we will once again dwell face to face with God and his presence will be there. But for now... God's presence is uniquely found among his church. Do you realize that's what the passage is saying? That though the, the, the temple isn't finished, it is being fashioned into a dwelling place for God. The Christians and corporately the body of Christians is how God's presence dwells with you and I today. God's presence is uniquely found among his people. So here's an issue of application that I want to speak to. If you understand Ephesians 2, that God's presence uniquely dwells among his people, the church, well, then this causes issue with those that say, I have a relationship with God. I long for the presence of God. I think my relationship with God is where it needs to be, but I have no time for God's people. Or I have no need to get plugged into a church. Do you see the disconnect? If God's presence is uniquely found among a people, well then we need to be actively involved with that people. So we've said before there's more and less valid reasons for uh, missing church. But why is it that we would care as a church about non-attendance or about caring for members who are going astray and no longer involved in church? We, we need to be, don't, don't think that missing church has no effect on your relationship with God. And yet we acknowledge there's, there's valid reasons, seasons of life where it makes attending church difficult. If you're in one of those seasons and you have valid reasons for not being here at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning, well then by all means you have to find ways to compensate for that in your life. And how will you experience the unique presence of God with his 
people in a corporate setting and how can your life be sustained that way certainly by all means communicate with us so that we know you are in a season of that needs special care because there are very real uh spiritual effects of that going through a season like that in your life but if you're in a less if you're in a less valid reason or you're in a season of your life where church hasn't been as important to you as it ought don't assume that your relationship with God isn't being affected by your lack of participation in the body of Christ. Of necessity, it's where God's presence dwells and your relationship will be affected. Try to make it a priority. Moving on from that, I want you to catch and see how important this is. In what, what has just happened, as we try to wrap this up and bring summary to it, right? If the church is a building project, that if our hope is set in the fact that God is uh, fashioning and forming us into a dwelling place for God's people, do you catch the reversal of what has taken place? In verses 11 and 12, when people were far from God, there was no hope. But now, because of Christ, we're being fashioned and formed into a place, pe people where God's presence would dwell. And I don't know about you, but that encourages me particularly on a week like this one of the, this week is no different than any of the other weeks we've had in the last several dozen but you look at the headlines that have come out of this last week and we're in the midst of a world that is just rapidly changing and the pace of that change is changing and you talk about wars and disasters and bank failures and conspiracies and uh, political implications of another election coming in 2024, and you just say, what is happening to the world today? Well, remember, brothers and sisters, that our hope is not set in any of those headlines being the way that you and I would want them to be as a Christian, but our hope is set in the fact that we are being formed and fashioned into a dwelling place for God. Th that's what you and I need to know and experience and relish and, and don't lose heart at what is taking place in the world today. A and otherwise, we will become disillusioned. We will begin to think that the mission of the church is things that it ought not be. That's another message for another day. But be encouraged that, that you and I, in the midst of a world that is crazy, God hasn't gotten one thing wrong in his architectural rendering of what he's shaping the church to be. And, and he's forming and fashioning you and I into the people of God who would be a dwelling place for God, and that ought to encourage us. So as we come into the Lord's table to think about this is what Christ's death did for us. God, by his Son, brought us into relationship with him and with one another so that we could reflect on what this means for us. Let's think about that as we take that to the table this morning. Father, we come to you. And we're grateful for what you've done for us in the person of Christ. Even as we get a chance to remember what Christ did for us on the cross, would you continue to orient our hearts with the truth of what God has done for us in Christ, the blood that was shed, the, the peace that was brought. Lord, if there are those here this morning who don't have that peace because they haven't repented of their sins, would you... Would you work in their hearts to help them see they need Christ. They need the blood of Christ to bring forgiveness of sins. For the Christians that are here this morning, may the death of Christ encourage us with what you've accomplished on our behalf. Would what you are accomplishing in our lives through the church encourage us to, to find that hope in what you have done for us through Christ? that our hearts would be brought into alignment with the true expectations you've given to us so that we wouldn't be people who are disillusioned. We ask and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.